So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, collaborative event uh, between the Cork Region and the Energy, Environment and Climate Action Division on engineering innovation to drive transition. I would like to especially welcome the Energy, Environment and Climate Action Division Committee who travelled down to Cork today to enjoy the sunny south. <laughs> um, we have two speakers today, which we will hear from with a Q&A at the end. So questions online can be input into the Q&A feature. And uh, just to go through the speakers, Xavier is an energy engineer with over 25 years experience in the energy efficiency and rene renewable energy. Building on his know-how and entrepreneurial skills, Xavier co-founded Retrokit Limited as a climate tech company with a mission to accelerate climate action in housing and tackle energy poverty. Mel is a chartered engineer with certified energy manager with over 20 years experience in design and project management on a wide range of private and public projects, including sustainable buildings, wind farms, energy efficiency, product and process design, waste and, energy, and, waste and resource efficiency. Mel currently manages a contract research unit at the Atlantic Technology University providing outreach external engagement in research development and innovation support to regional enterprises, communities, and individuals. So on that, I'd like to start with uh, Xavier, who's going to give his present with me. Or... Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. I think even Donald, you were the one that uh, kind of pushed the buttons. And, uh, I think Brian is sick on David, so it's good to, to, to be here. I, felt, I think it's my first address officially to uh, Engineers Ireland. Uh, I am an engineer myself, as you've heard, with a few decades of experience in the energy uh, efficiency and renewable energy sector. But tonight I'm uh, supposed to be a young chick uh, entrepreneur <laughs> working for a startup, but as you can see, I, I started the, that journey late in life, uh, but it's been, um, it's a immensely rewarding on many fronts. So anyone with a good idea, and I'm sure engineers are always full of good ideas, um, you know, don't hesitate to take on the entrepreneurial your journey. There's a lot of support out there. I think that's important. Uh, we need a lot of innovation when it comes to uh, climate solutions. Uh, we've taken the know-how we've built over many years, um, you know, as practitioners and <laughs> our drives turned us into technology solutions. So software in our case. Um, and I guess part of the motivation is that we, we have an emergency and this huge challenges we need to tackle, obviously, on the climate front. But we're, our focus is on the, the housing elements of it. And um, in that context, the kind of three pillars to our mission is to tackle climate uh, change, obviously, uh, and decarbonization drives. Uh, but also um, with the current situation in the housing, uh, with a serious housing crisis and a serious energy poverty crisis, there is a real huge rationale to drive and scale up energy retrofit in housing. And that's what our mission is all about. Um, the context in all of that is obviously decades, and, you know, really 30 years of push in terms of uh, sustainable energy, um, and uh, very, very strong ambitions and targets to decarbonize our housing stock, which is going to translate in huge, massive investments over the next uh, 20 years, really, 30 years, in fact, uh, which we estimate at 275 billion euros across Europe. So you can imagine the scale of the challenge, but the scale of the opportunity is equally massive. Having said that, when we work with our uh, clients and try and understand where they are now and where they aim to go, you know, there's a number of key uh, common challenges they face. Often we hear, well, don't really know where to start. We uh, have a problem of accessing the data we need to start planning and building a roadmap for the big investment we have to make so that we can make the right decisions and get things going. And, and oh, the other one, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with in, in your engineers' lives, it's the shortage of skills and labor, and it's very huge in construction and by extension in the retrofit sector as well. So retrofit, let's say scaling up operation is a big challenge for everyone in the face of really demanding targets 
uh, on that front. And then equally, there's a there's a lot of money being pumped in the sector, which comes with strong reporting requirements. You know, and and demonstrating what you're doing and the impact it's having is a key challenge as well. So um, these are a number of uh, let's say problems uh, our customers are facing, and for us, that's that's what is driving how we've built the solution and try and answer those uh, challenges. Right, so <clears throat> when we look at it at a very practical level, and this map is probably too small for you to read from where you are, and possibly online would be better, but um, this is the typical homeowner journey if you are, let's say, planning and starting your journey into a deep energy retrofit, working with your one scholarship, shop, right? So, it starts with the awareness raising, the kind of education piece, the marketing piece, and the advice that's going to lead you to kind of start making decisions. Uh, and then, you know, you're moving on to doing home and surveys, getting contractors involved, getting the funding involved, finance, et cetera. The key of this side is that there's a lot of different steps and different stakeholders to be involved and a lot of information that data needs to flow along the journey. That's very challenging uh, to try and make sure all works smoothly, that all the information is captured, it's generated at the right time, it's moving to the right people, and nothing is lost along the way. And we believe digitalization uh, has a, a very important role to play in that regard. That's going to remove a lot of pain points in the process to accelerate it, but also uh, to increase productivity and save costs along the way. So what, the, what did we build effectively to try and support uh, and, and improve things and, and help our users and customers uh, in achieving what they're aiming to do in a more productive, better, more enjoyable way? Uh, when we built the platform uh, that's uh, cloud-based, that has a number of, let's say, key functions and, and solutions built in. One, it's about managing big data. So when we started our journey, our aim was to work with social housing bodies and to help them uh, in that planning phase. Uh, and uh, we were very uh, uh, strongly supported by our two local authorities. Uh, Brian was our very early adopter and, and loyal customer and strong supporter in course the council and um, equally the housing team in core county council have been very supportive. Uh, so the first element of is to gather all your BR data. So imagine you have a stock with maybe 10,000 homes. That's a lot of data to manage. Uh, first of all, locate information and centralize it. And having access to it was a, a very common challenge. So we bring all that into a platform. It's all parsed into very powerful database that gives you the insights you need to start understanding how the stock performs now and start planning uh, the planning process. Then we have modeling tools that allows you to effectively test all sorts of options on how to retrofit a home at the macro level or a housing stock at macro level if you're working on a, a 10 year investment plan, for example. Um, that kind of creates a before and after situation and you can then compare um, the KPIs uh, and, and measure your impact and also understand what's the optimal solution for your given house or housing stock. And with that information, we start making decisions. So it's a decision-making support tool and work towards the, the, the planning of your retrofit campaign. Again, it can be a one uh, house report, a home and geographic plan, for example, or it can be that overall property portfolio uh, roadmap um, in terms of bringing it to uh, B2, for example, whatever your target may be. So it's about also generating information and turning that into uh, reports that meet different requirements for our customers. Again, the key piece here is all the analysis done at individual dwelling levels. You can leverage that to uh, develop a, a tender document, for example, or, uh, or at a very macro level when it comes to that strategic uh, investment plan. As I said, we started working with social housing bodies. We wanted to be able to manage the big numbers. That was really our motivator. Uh, and also obviously recognizing the, the, the social mission of social housing uh, and the impact it's having on, on people's lives. Uh, and, but about a year ago when the 
uh, deep retrofit program, the one-stop shop program in Israel was launched. We Hybris and decided that okay, well, you know, we can leverage the tools to be able to service that sector as well. And since then, we've had really good traction with what let's say generally we call large contractors, uh, one-stop shops being a key element of this. Um, and equally with uh, their uh, let's say uh, their consultants, their uh, VR assessors, energy engineers who provide uh, services through them. And what we're seeing now, which is really interesting in exciting space, where the intersect between the social housing bodies and the one-stop shops delivering direct retrofit services and very often the design services and in the, developing the plan. So um, for us, the next step, the next evolution will be to really support that collaboration, cooperation space and integration of workflows, data flows, et cetera, between those two very important stakeholders, and then linking in with the rest of the ecosystem, including SCI for funding, including banks, the finance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We've also done a lot of work with uh, what SCI calls sustainability communities. So there's a national program, and Mel is very involved uh, in that program, in delivering mentoring services to community organizations around the country and supporting those communities on their sustainable energy journey. And they get funding from SCI to develop an energy master plan. Consultants working for those SECs leverage the platform to develop the, the, that master plan. So they, they use our analytics to, to do that. And equally, we work with policymakers that need, you know, the, that the day shine, the inevitable powers we, we have in the system. Our team started with a bunch of enthusiastic uh, co founders. Energy geeks mostly, and then we added layers of software engineering capability onto that and operational uh, management, etc. So now we're uh, six people, there's a part time person, and uh, regularly growing the team, which is really exciting. I, I you know, I've been a solo for, uh, engineer for many years, and uh, that was one of the key aspects of, of me in, in terms of um, you know, growing as a professional is to to really learn how to work and, and um, really deliver with a team. We've been really lucky to be uh, recognized for what we do for a number of years now and got a, a good crop of innovation awards uh, or different awards along the way from different organizations, including um, abroad. Just a glimpse on the tech. Uh, I'm not a software engineer, so I don't ask me too many questions on that front, but essentially it's a cloud-based solution uh, leveraging state-of-the-art uh, software architecture and systems. Uh, we have an API where we can connect with other applications, other platforms, our customers are using, uh, supporting uh, integrated workflows and data flows, um, and, uh, but also supporting rapid prototyping, uh, and, and that's a very exciting uh, space as well, where you know, the process of designing, developing software is becoming quicker and quicker. And artificial intelligence and machine learning is really uh, coming into play there. So just to give you a little insight as to what the platform does and how it does this, that's our, it's a data acquisition uh, app. So we're connected in the national uh, BR database where we consent from a homeowner, uh, being it for one house or for thousands of homes. Uh, we can download that data and, and bring it to our database, and uh, it's ready available then for users to 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 start working on it in, in a manner that's very seamless and very quick. Um, we then have a dashboard with a number of let's say analytics uh, built in that allows you to understand how the overall stock is performing, and then drilling in different elements of the housing stock. Um, and identifying, for example, where the low hanging fruits might be, or the very difficult cases, or there's also mapping applications that allows you to, to work on an area based approach when uh, planning and delivering energy retrofits. That's the map here. And um, then we have the modeling tool I've mentioned. So you can test with about 55 different uh, energy upgrade measures built in the system that allows you to test all sorts of options and find what is the optimal solution to upgrade a house or a bunch of houses that are on a project you're working on. <clears throat> and uh, and that might be for a different criteria. It might well just need to achieve the B2 and the requirements to get the grants from SEI or we're really focused on alleviating energy poverty. So we're going to find the right solutions that reduce energy credits, that kind of, uh, let's say, multi-criteria uh, decision-making. 
once the modeling is done and as uh, you define what's the right approach and measures to be implemented, we can again turn this into different types of reports to very granular or to macro level uh, to uh, service different needs around the process. Uh, and this is about the integration into different ecosystems. So our gateway API allows us to connect to different other, uh, let's say, uh, software solutions that can help with contract management or with, uh, say, procurement processes or uh, with surveys and collecting data, uh, and surveys, quotation systems, funding and finance, asset management, preventative maintenance. They, like the housing sector especially has done a lot of work on digitalization here in Ireland, but also very much in the UK. Uh, and there's now really quite a range of, uh, let's say, integration uh, potential uh, where the energy piece and the decarbonization piece becomes part of the delivery uh, on, on upgrading a stock or maintaining a, a stock overall here in Ireland. There's a company called Adjust that's developed a very interesting platform in the facility contract management and um, uh, maintenance area, asset management, and they've been commissioned by the GMA to pilot uh, their systems across two local authorities, including Cork City Council. It's always at the forefront of innovation. Uh, and uh, we hope to uh, develop a partnership with them and, and, and really test that integration going forward. Uh, that's the sales pitch, but you know, essentially it's about really providing um, solutions that are, let's say, data and analytics that are reliable and that you can trust on. You know, there's a lot of money riding on these projects, including getting grants if you want to be sure that you're meeting all the requirements. Uh, so there's you know, serious model calculations and, and logic being applied there, but it's not very <laughs> almost as instant feedback on decisions you're making, think you want to test, et cetera. Try to make this as visually attractive and interesting and user-friendly as possible. It's been a very secure, uh, scalable uh, uh, data management systems and, and processing uh, capabilities on one of the servers here in Ireland. Um, and it ultimately it's about reducing time spent on menial tasks, copy and paste stuff in spreadsheets and Word document, et cetera. Uh, and really uh, you know, getting things done quicker and enabling you know, our customers and, and, and uh, decision makers to focus their resources in the right place, i.e. getting things done. We spend a lot of time learning from our customers, understanding their needs, designing solutions with them, and then supporting them on their journey. That's a, an essential aspect of what we're doing. Um, yeah, I think that's again about our approach in terms of customer support. And I think that's the extent of my presentation. Oh, oh, oh. As Patrick introduced me there, my name is Mel Gavin. I work at the Atlantic Technological University. I'm based in the Sligo campus. I'm here today standing in for a colleague of mine who was the main driver of this project, Red Wolf. Uh, but I had been involved from the, from the start. But my colleague, Stevie Donnelly, couldn't be here today, so he's asked me to stand in. Uh, as I say, he, he was the main the main driver behind it. So I'll just give you, uh, I suppose, an overview of exactly what the ATU is at the Atlantic Technology University. You may or may not have heard of it. Um, we'll cover the Red Wolf project itself. Um, within that, then, we refer to things like dispatch down of renewable energy. So I, 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 I'll try and give an overview of that. How that, that might, how the system might um, communicate or integrate with the with the air grid, with the larger electricity grid, and then the development of the pilots that were were facilitated through the Redwood project, and that were um, the partners involved in that were Cork City Council. So the ATU used to be um, a, a bunch of different colleges: IT Sligo, GMIT, LYIT, and now St Angela's College as well. So they've come together. They formed a technology university that's been happening all over Ireland. Most of you will have heard of it. So that's us now, ATU. The unit I work in in, in the ATU is called the Contract Research Unit, um, or, or, or the CRU, which is often mistakenly confused with the Commission for Regulation of Utilities. I will say that we had the acronym before they did, uh, but they're better known than we are. Uh, they were still the CEO when we changed our, our name. So, so the, the, the idea of this graphic here is just to say that we're completely outward facing. None of the team are lecturers or academics. Um, we work with all sorts of agencies and we have to fund our unit through these various projects. 
one of which is this Redwood project, which was funded through um, Interreg uh, Northwest Europe. That's a picture of the Red Wolf team as they were um, on one of the site visits to the college in Sligo. And then we're into the Red Wolf project itself. So as I was saying, we have to acknowledge the funders here were Interreg Northwest Europe. Um, that, that's continually opening. I think it's opening up for more calls again uh, shortly in the new year. Um, so we will be looking to perhaps advance maybe Red Wolf or a few other projects through that fund. Now, the acronym, as you can see there, Red Wolf, and you can see what it stands for. It's it's probably shocking the amount of time research is put into coming up with snappy, snappy acronyms. And I can't claim credit for this. This was led by Leeds Beckett University. So they came up with this. So that the acronym there stands for Rethinking Electricity Distribution Without Load Following. That makes a, a nice, neat Red Wolf. So the various partners you can see let's say the countries and the general areas where they're from mapped there in the Euro, in the in the map of Europe, Northwest Europe. You can see the whole list. I won't read them all. I'll refer to perhaps the more relevant ones. Obviously, the lead partner there is Leeds Beckett University in the UK. Um, we had, at the time, the Institute of Technology, Sligo. We were, the, the, the job we took on was to manage the Irish pilots. We worked with two organisations that provided pilot sites in Ireland. That's Cork City Council and Carberry Housing also for, for units based here in Cork. Um, and then I would also like to mention Gloss Energy or another Irish company that came into the project later on. They provided part of the smart control system. Uh, we were very happy working with them. So the challenge here was the, the ongoing challenge that we all know about when we talk about renewable energy, and that is the discrepancy between generation and demand. Um, generation from intermittent sources and demand from, from our homes and from our businesses and, uh, and wherever. So at the moment, the, the current scenario is that if the demand is high and there isn't very much renewable energy available on the grid, we have to back up that demand with, with gas plants, really, peak power plants, and that is relatively carbon intensive. Now, we also know that from a policy perspective, certainly on the domestic market, the policy is to move heating systems towards electrical heating systems, primarily with um, heat pumps, which are efficient, generally speaking, but uh, it is going to move more demand if, onto the electricity grid. So the questions here that the project attempted to answer was how that challenge can be resolved, and then more specifically, how can a system in incorporating solar PV as a supply, batteries and storage heaters as storage elements, um, how can we combine them in an intelligent way to help deal with that discrepancy? So the project then, the outputs that were promised at, at the very start, we were applying for the money, is 100 pilot dwellings in the UK, Ireland, France and Luxembourg. Now, obviously, getting 100 uh, separate private individuals would be challenging. So in most cases, it was best to work with larger landlords that, that looked after a number of housing stock. And we were also looking for dwellings with, with, some, with some hybrid storage in them already. And that's why the focus here was on solar PVs, batteries, and homes that were currently heated with storage heaters rather than wet heating systems. There's no reason this couldn't be incorporated with, with heat pumps as well as an electrical demand for heating. <laughs> but the decision made at the time was to look was to target properties that use storage heaters. In that sense, it at least added some thermal storage capacity as well as being able to install uh, electrical storage capacity as well in the battery. And then the primary piece that was developed through this was the smart control technology to interact, interact both with the, the electrical system in the home or the energy system in the home, and then external signals from the grid, from weather forecasts, from other local energy consumption as well. There's a lot of and uh, links there, and obviously you'll get the slides after this, so you'll be able to see uh, more information around those project websites. Now, that's not the end. I know it looks like the end, but um, Stevie had asked me just to refer to this dispatch down of renewable energy. And this was part of the value of the project as well, to see if we could reduce that this dispatch gem down. Without reading through all of that, essentially there, the third paragraph really explains it, that... The dispatch down element of renewable energy is the amount of renewable energy that is available but can't be used by the system. 
And that happens through two mechanisms known as curtailment and constraint. They're just to do with whether they're uh, larger um, aspects of the system or local aspects of constraint. So in 2021, of the total wind energy generated in Ireland, approximately 7.4% of that was unavailable. So that was dispatched down. It was essentially lost to our demand. So there is the, the concept of the Red Wolf system would be, would help to reduce that. In other words, creating a way where if that wind energy is available, the system, albeit on a small domestic um, scale, but on a, on a distributed basis, would be able to, to use, to demand that energy and then use it in the home at a, at a, a later time. And that's just a little bit more information around that and the impact of COVID-19 that it had, that it had, let's say, in, in 2020 that we saw. And also, I suppose, the other uh, thing to mention now that I see the word COVID-19 is the, the time context of the development of this project. It was applied for in 2018. It, the, the project started in 2019. And since then, we've obviously had the impact of COVID and the war in Ukraine, and we all know the uh, the impacts that has had on electricity prices. That being said, the 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 project team are still confident that there is a solution being presented in here. Now, I'm not going to read all of that element about dispatch down down either. But um, going on to this all iron fuel mix again, most of us will be used to seeing diagrams around this as to how the, all of the energy or electricity on, on the island was, was met in 2021. We saw there we have 35% being met by renewables and then the breakdown of that, obviously it's, it's largely wind. We also know from a policy context that the policy is going to try and increase that 35% segment to 80%. So we are dealing with more and more renewables, most likely more, more, more wind, obviously a good bit more solar as well. But that means there's there's the potential for more and more of that dispatch down to, to, to enter into the system. Now, the other element that the project intended to interact with, and there was consultation with Airgrid and with uh, ESB networks on this, was the the I suppose the data available from, from Airgrid where there is a forecast of wind energy. Where there's a forecast of wind energy, there's a quite a high confidence level that that would be. Uh, lower carbon intensive energy. So if that forecast is available as a signal, it could interact with the Red Wolf system. That, that's essentially the concept of it. Um, CO2 intensity is, isn't forecast or at the minute, or at least it wasn't when we were doing the project, it is backcast, but it would be linked to the element, the amount of wind energy available on the system. So that, that's the, the point of this here. Um, so the, the ideal would be that in the future, a signal of CO2 intensity would be available. That, that signal would be a control aspect feeding into the, 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 the Red Wolf system in the home and would, would allow you to, or allow the system to plan when it's going to draw down, when it's going to demand electricity from the grid. <clears throat> so moving on to the pilots. So we had a, a central server, um, it's actually housed in the college in Sligo. Um, and that was where most of the control and, and the, the signals would pass through. That would obtain the following data so from the whole country. It, it was getting the, the system marginal price from AirGrid. The, you know, the, the, the aim in the future would be to get that fuel mix and CO2 intensity in real time or as a projection that's currently not available, but the, the, the system itself is designed to have that when it is available. And then it's also dealing with the, the site-specific um, data. So the local grid connection, um, the local weather forecast from Met Office data, and then the, the system in the house itself. So you'd have the, the inverter data and the, and the diverter data. So diverting electricity to perhaps the hot water tank. And then the smart meter data as well. That, that is something that is that is being worked into the 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 design of the system probably in the in the next phase of this project as it moves forward. Now on the pilots, um, as I said, we were looking at at hybrid systems, so involving a few different technologies. Solar PV is a fairly obvious one. You have all your your DC and AC wiring and your isolators. 
There's a battery energy energy storage system to go with it. We have a hybrid inverter, a battery inverter and charge controller, storage heaters. In some cases, the, the pilot uh, sites had existing storage heaters, but in, in many cases, they were, those were replaced with, uh, with newer units, better controls. The storage heaters then, that would normally be, be switched on during nighttime tariffs or off-peak tariffs. Uh, um, another switch or a contactor was installed to allow remote um, switching of that by the, the, the Redwood control. The energy man management system then would control electricity flows. It would monitor and it would log the data. It has the, the diverter to the resistive loads being the, the, the domestic hot water. Um, and then also would have a, a signal coming in from the room, the, the, the thermostats essentially. There is also an element of communications then. So we have a 3G or 4G network, and that was to facilitate both the client's control of the system and the, the offsite monitoring via the, the server that's up in Sligo. Now, very complex diagram here, but not all that complex when you break it down. We have on the, along the bottom here, we have the standard domestic loads, so your, your electric heating loads, other electrical loads, some other resistive loads then, um, and they also ha have storage elements to them. So the, the, the hot water cylinder and, uh, and some other storage heaters as well. Um, we have the battery built in as an electrical store as well. Solar PV as an on-site generator, obviously the grid as, as, as the primary or backup, and the Red Wolf controller then um, basically controlling the electrical flows and, this, and the signals between those units. Now in the pilots here for, for, for Cork City Council, there were two sites, the apartments at Grenville and the other apartments then in Dominic Street. The apartments of Grenville were, were very well suited to this project. Uh, and I think at this stage as well, uh, and not just, uh, I mean, for, for, for both sides at this stage, we'd have to acknowledge the, the participation of the tenants in this. This wasn't, you know, completely non-disruptive This Cork City Council did everything they could to make it as simple as possible for them. But they did participate in this and, and uh, we, we should acknowledge that at this stage. So, in general, now, some systems were slightly different, but in general, we were talking about a three kilowatt peak solar system. So, so nothing massive, what you'd expect at a domestic level. The Huawei inverter, a five kilowatt hour battery, again, what you'd expect at a domestic level. The standard diverter we, we're all used to seeing. The storage heaters, where, where, storage, where new storage heaters were provided, they're, um, they're all Dimplex quantum, so they're quite a high quality unit. <clears throat> various temperature and humidity sensors, a D-Link um, 3G, 4G router, uh, the Eastron energy meter, um, and then this controller, which was provided by Gloss, Gloss Energy Technologies. That was a, a kind of a, a bespoke system they put together. And we have a remote connectivity as well through NetSolero. And then to look at what that means physically, and this is why I want to acknowledge this in the tenant participation in this is, is that these things had to be put in their homes. In, in Grenville, there was a space in the communal areas. And you can see that there on the right, you can see the three batteries in the bottom, the inverters, and then the controllers up at the top. That's all uh, closed off now, that's all secure. Um, obviously the solar panels on the roof and Grenville had a reasonable aspect in terms of the, the where the roofs were facing. And, you know, we still had enough space to put these other units within the, within the, um, within the, the apartments themselves. This is uh, one other house that was involved in Chair Lawn, and they had storage heating in place at the time, so that's why it was suitable. But you can see that this is a, this is an imposition in, in the living area there, but it was done quite neatly. These batteries are about the size of a large suitcase, so this, but they still have to be put somewhere. Um, so that's the, that's the site there in, in Chair Lawn. You can see Brian and, and my colleague Stevie is in one of those as well, I'm over there on the, on the, on the left. <coughs> Just a few more pictures of the overall system and, and the glass element as well. And then back into these schematics. So the, the glass Red Wolf controller is the one that controls all those flows, as, as I said, you have the, the, the my energy eddy diverter um, for the control of hot water. 
there is a data stick for the battery inversion for control and monitoring. Additional meters and additional sensors were, were included in, in most sites. And then you had this contactor for changing how the storage heaters would draw down electricity overnight or not. So this was the dashboard built for, again, there's a lot of information here. The, the point of showing this is to say that the system did work. So we had control of the, uh, had control and monitoring, not control of the grid, but monitoring of the grid, obviously control of the, the hybrid storage system, the battery charging and discharging. And so that was achieved without going into any great deal of what that is. The next slide really has the, the overall concept. So trying to explain this, there's, it's what we're seeing in this diagram, the blue line here is the CO2 intensity of the grid over the course of the day. And this <laughs> happened to be February the 12th, 2022. Now there would be a lot of other lines on this diagram if we want to see exactly how this interacted. But taking the, just that as an example, if that were a prediction of CO2 intensity, knowing what the, the, the domestic dwelling would need over the course of 24 hours, um, knowing what, let's say, its, its maximum power drawdown from the grid would ideally be at five kilowatts, predicting 48 hours there. Sorry, this is this is 48 hours, not 24. Um, if you're looking at 45 kilowatt hours as a total energy requirement, bear in mind this is for heating and electricity. <clears throat> so at five kilowatts, you could technically draw that down over the course of nine hours. So the Redwood system is designed to deal with that as a signal, and then to prioritize those low carbon intensity areas, you can see six hours, two hours, one hour, below this threshold of maybe 140 um, grams per <clears throat> kilowatt hour, as, as, the, as the priority times to draw down energy. If you're using electricity in the house at that time, some of that's gonna to go to that. If you're not using enough, it's gonna to go to either your battery, probably um, primarily the battery, Secondarily, the storage heaters. Third would be perhaps the the domestic hot water system, and then if those if those are full, obviously it stops drawing down. Mm -hmm. So that that is the concept uh, of of the system. The at the end of the project, which finished technically there in September, the the servers are still running. This the the systems are still running. The, the data is still being collected. The end of this project. The Lees Beckett were happy that they had proved the concept. They had been able to control electricity flows in Cork via the server in, in Sligo from Leeds Beckett based on a simulated signal of, of grid intensity. That was the whole concept of it. Now, it is at a domestic scale, so it's hard to say that was, that's going to solve all of our problems. But at a distributed domestic scale, it, could, it can have a larger, larger, larger impact. Um, it's not going to solve every domestic energy system, but it should be part of the mix. It's <laughs> certainly worth following. Moving on from where we got to with the Red Wolf project as it stands, the concept, the technology, the technology is available, the concept works, uh, the technology works. The, the areas to look at next would be regulation, for one. You know, what's the what's the impacts of this kind of these kind of signals being going back and forth? And then the, the other would be the market. Who's going, to, who's going to play different roles in this? Who's going to manage that controller? Is it going to be your electricity supplier? Is it going to be a different company that would manage that as a service? So that's really the areas probably to go to next. Certainly still more work on the technology, um, but that is the concept. Thank you for listening. <laughs>